In the last few years, a new technology has developed in Africa, and you've probably never had access to it. But that technology might just change the way we think about healthcare. I'd like to tell you about Florent. Florent sold soap for a living. He was 16 when a truck crashed into his shopping stall by the road. His brothers rushed him to the nearest hospital in a blanket tied to a stick. Florent had lost consciousness. When they arrived in the emergency room, the blanket was soaked in blood, and his right arm and leg were twisted in an unnatural way. He needed immediate surgery to survive. I was at this hospital in Cameroon that night. The surgeon and I, we scrubbed, rushed to the operating room and waited for the patient to be brought in. But Florent didn't come. After a while, we went back to the emergency room. The IV line was still dangling from the drip stand. But Florent was gone, and so was his family. What had happened? We asked the nurses. As was their usual routine, they had asked his family to go to the pharmacy to buy drugs, IV fluids, sutures, even the gloves for the operation. The family did the math. They were willing to pay, but they just didn't have the cash with them or any other means to pay right there and then. And this is why they were asked to leave. Upon hearing this, the surgeon I was working with just lost it. He made the nurses go out into the night and search for Florent. He even offered to pay for the drugs himself. But Florent did not return. And the next day I learned that he had died that night, just steps away from the hospital gate. The surgeon I got to know that night was Dr. Elson, a visiting surgeon from Madagascar. There was something special about Elson. He had worked in rural Africa for years, and in a context where there's almost no health insurance and no comprehensive state-funded health care, patients being turned away by a hospital sadly is a common reality. And in fact, stories like Florence happen so many times every day in Africa. But Elson was a man who would not accept a single patient going without the care they needed. Elson's vision was to return to Madagascar and open a hospital for the poor, where no one would be turned away. Now, you might think of Madagascar as uh, you know, animation movies or uh, amazing wildlife, but there is another side to Madagascar, and that is that 93% of the population live below the poverty line. In the remote south of the island, Elson and his wife converted an old rice mill into a hospital. Children would fetch water from outside the village and sell it to the hospital, and electricity would come from a small generator that would regularly break. This was the only surgical hospital within 150 kilometers, an area for roughly one million people. Referrals were out of the question because of the distances, and during the rainy season, the hospital would be cut off for weeks at a time when roads would turn into streams and mud holes would become insurmountable obstacles. But patients came. Soon the hospital was working at its capacity, and patients would be sleeping everywhere outside on the hospital grounds. Every hour of every day, Elson was on call for emergencies, his wife standing next to him, holding a torch for him to see. 
When I started to work as a doctor, I spent all my holidays at this hospital. I was absolutely amazed to see it grow. At first, I asked friends and family for help, and a little later, we registered as an NGO. Soon, we had enough money together to build a proper hospital. It opened in 2015. It has 40 beds, a staff of 20, two fully equipped operating rooms. But most importantly, from the first day, this was entirely managed by our Madagascan partners. And it's been running successfully since in one of the poorest regions on Earth. To keep itself sustainable and self-reliant, the hospital does charge for care. But one thing was clear. The story of Florent must not repeat itself. So in an emergency, the hospital treats first and sorts payment later. But this brought problems of its own. Sometimes, the hospital had to keep patients for weeks of extra time until the bills were paid. For example, Ina, a young mother who had given birth to twins, she had to spend an extra three weeks on the hospital compound for her bill to be paid. So her family, during that time, sold some of their cattle. Her brother took the money in cash to the hospital. He paid the bill. Ina could go home. But to achieve this, the hospital had to waste energy and time to keep her as a medical hostage. And again, this is so common in Africa, most hospitals in a similar setting, they have a dedicated room or a dedicated building where they keep patients until the bills are paid. Another more tragic story is that of Malala, a young woman with a life-threatening bleeding after delivery. Our ambulance had arrived in her village and wanted to take her to the hospital, but her father stepped in the way, refusing to let her go. Why? Well, the last time someone from his family had been to a hospital, he was shocked by the bill. All sorts of unexpected fees and side payments he didn't understand. He felt cheated by the hospital, and that brought his family close to ruin. So maybe this time they could have afforded the treatment, but they weren't willing to take the risk. So, when hospitals have the power to set prices or deny treatment, then patients are the weakest link in the chain. We never knew what happened to Malala. But while we were grappling with these sorts of problems, a huge change was creeping up on us. All right, and I need your participation now. I would love to know who of you in this room does not have a bank account. Can you raise your arm, please? So not have a bank account. No one. Wow. So to put this in perspective, 99% of Germans have a bank account. All of you seem to have one. So I would like you to think for a minute how life would be like without one. How would you receive your salary? How would you pay your electricity bill? How would you save? Well, not having a bank account is normal for most Africans. Fewer than 5% of Madagascans have a bank account. And that's because the small savings of the poor are just not worth the bank's effort to offer them accounts or for health insurance to offer them policies. So when we started working seven years ago, this is what a bank transfer looked like in Madagascar. The hospital had to hire an armed guard who would take a bag full of cash, go into the car, and drive for 200 kilometers to pay it into the bank account. But since then, something absolutely dramatic has happened. Every town 
and every village in Madagascar, and that place is so remote, you can have a hard time finding even a single plastic bag, they're now connected to the outside world with a mobile phone tower. More than half of Madagascans have a phone, and there's a million new users each year. And in the footsteps of this revolution has followed mobile money. Now, mobile money allows you to send money from one phone to the other without the need for a bank account. You can deposit money the same way that you charge up a phone credit, so with a simple scratch card. It's safe, it's easy, transferring money takes just some seconds, and millions of ordinary Africans use it every day to receive their salary, to send money to loved ones. I actually have it in my pocket, how it goes on. Okay, it's not a text, it's not a text, it's, not a, it's something different. It's something different, it's, it's the real thing. This is the real thing. So, the mobile money thing is so easy, you don't need internet to do that. It's like sending an SMS. And it's so useful that it's spread extraordinarily fast. And this is the real thing because when I asked Elson if his hospital had received any funds with mobile money, his answer was yes. They got half their revenue in 2017 over this phone. So, while we were thinking about how we could finance healthcare by supporting hospitals, this technology was developing that gave people unprecedented control of their finances. And that shifted our thinking. Could we instead support patients to pay for their care? Could we help patients like Florent, Aina, and Malala? Now, in a cash economy, saving money is risky. If you have money under your bed, that can get stolen. If you uh, have a large investment like farmland, that can only be sold in one piece. So, let's imagine a health savings account on your phone. A health wallet. This works exactly like mobile money, but with the crucial exception that money can only be spent at registered clinics. And there is no way for you to take it out spend it on other things, take it out in cash, you know, send it to uh, your loved ones, go to the pub, so you know it's there for when you need it most. Let's take it a step further. A government, an NGO, or people like you, or me, or a patient's family, they can all send money to the health wallet and be sure it can only be used for health care. Money can also be restricted to specific procedures, like checkups during pregnancy or uh, HIV treatment. And if there are several registered clinics in an area, it's the patients that can choose the one that gives the best care, because ultimately it's them carrying the money. Funds can also be used to top up savings if a certain amount has been deposited, so to encourage people to save for healthcare. But crucially, the health wallet helps to make payments more transparent and to reduce the risk for corruption. Now, how does that work? The health wallet provider agrees on fixed prices with the clinics, so the patients know in advance how much they need to pay. And in order to get their money, the hospitals need to register the treatment and the bill. And that very much reduces the opportunity for corrupt hospital staff to extract extra charges. So, 
Many of these ideas are already being pioneered in other African countries. But how would this have helped our patients? Now, Florence family, they would have had an emergency savings account that's accessible immediately. For Aina, she could have sent the money in a matter of minutes, saving her a three-week-long stay at the hospital. And Malala's father, he wouldn't have had to be afraid of these unpredictable or illegitimate fees. Earlier this year, we, we took this idea to the Madagascan government. Friday night, we were sitting down with the uh, Deputy Minister of Health at his office. He was very tired, leaning back in his chair. But when he heard about the health wallet, he did like this. And then... And he said, I smell it. I smell it. He jumped up, he opened the doors to, the, to his colleagues who were still there on a Friday at 8. Everyone came in, and right there and then, they started a commission, a working group, that is now working with us to pilot the health wallet in Madagascar later this year. And if that's going to work, the health wallet will become an integral part for the Madagascan healthcare system, and it's a country of 24 million people. So our dream is that one day, everyone in Madagascar will get care when they need it, and that's regardless of their income. But that might not happen in a way we expect. Africa is not just catching up with the West. Africa is using new technologies to find completely different solutions to the problems modern societies face. If we can listen to the way Africa is changing and we prepare to change our thinking, then we have a unique opportunity right now to transform healthcare in Africa and to make sure that cases like Florence do not happen again. Thank you. <laughs>